Soft snow adorned the disheveled shack atop a small plot of land in Farmington, New Hampshire. It was a bitterly cold day on February 16, 1812, as Abigail Colbath and her husband Winthrop gave birth to their first son, Jeremiah Jones. As the abstractly and generationally impoverished couple lay over their newly born child, who later said that, quote, Want sat by his cradle, end quote, they seldom knew what he would accomplish in his life. This is Henry Wilson and the Civil War. Henry Wilson was born on February 16, 1812, in the small and poor community of Farmington, New Hampshire. Wilson's parents, Abigail and Winthrop Colbath, had both been raised in Farmington and had family roots before the American Revolution. In his biography of Henry Wilson, Richard Abbott describes Winthrop Colbath as, quote, the poorest poor man in a poor county. Winthrop was known for being lazy and a heavy drinker, which many asserted to be the reason Henry Wilson later became a temperance activist. Though disheveled, lazy, and penniless, Winthrop's neighbor, Abigail Witham, fell in love, marrying him on October 14, 1811, just five months before the birth of their first son, Jeremiah. When he was first born, Wilson was given the name Jeremiah Jones and retained that name until 1833, the year this episode will be stopping at. So for the continuation of this episode, I'll be referring to the contemporary Henry as Jeremiah. He got his name because his father essentially admired a wealthy neighbor, and he decided to name him after him, the story goes, so that he would possibly benefit financially from that. That doesn't, d didn't ever pan out. This is Kyle Leach. He'll help guide us through Henry Wilson's early days in Farmington. I'm uh, Kyle Leach. I am the curator for the Museum of Farmington History in Farmington, New Hampshire. Besides a very small handful of landowners, the lot of Farmington remained incredibly poor, as most farming communities in New England were. The rough and mostly stony soil of the Northeast provided difficult terrain for successful and consistent farming, nonetheless dampered by drought and extreme winters. The people that are here in Farmington are kind of self-sufficient. Uh, it's, it's, you know, being an agrarian town, you're a little bit isolated, so you have to um, really be independent. Uh, during the early 1800s, essentially most people are still walking. Um, they're doing things on horseback, and uh, very wealthy people will have uh, carriages. Um, but, uh, you know, trying to travel outside of town is going to be awkward and is going to be um, difficult sometimes, especially during our winters. Uh, so you, you try to be as self-sufficient as possible. You try to get everything down in the, in the central nexus. While farming was difficult, it was one of the only low-skilled jobs available in the area. As Winthrop worked as a day laborer, Abigail raised their son, frequently reading to him. Along with Abigail's reading, Jeremiah's young passion for knowledge was supplemented by some school. Jeremiah always enjoyed reading and learning, especially history. While Jeremiah's want for knowledge was strong, access was limited. Before the age of the public library, or public school, very few books were available to the young boy, leaving him strapped for an education. Education for Jeremiah Colbath at that time um, was not unlike those of so many other people, including Abraham Lincoln, who was three years older than Jeremiah Colbath. This is Joe Weiss. Joe has been researching Wilson for many years. You'll be hearing his voice throughout the series. But Colbath spent his education in a one-room schoolhouse, read the district's school books over and over and over again. One day, when Jeremiah was just eight, he and a fellow schoolboy got into a scuffle. As the sand and dirt flung into the air as the two boys wrestled, a well-respected townswoman, Mrs. Anstress Eastman, broke the boys up. Jeremiah's ragged foe dashed from the scene as the woman began to scold the boys for acting so ruffian. Despite her stern attitude, she asked whether or not Jeremiah could read. When the boy said he could, Mrs. Eastman brought the boy back to her husband's library, allowing him to access the collection following his reading of the Bible. Throughout Jeremiah's young years, 
Mrs. Eastman, let the boy borrow books and take worn hand-me-down clothes. Mrs. Eastman's brother, Levi Woodbury, later went on to become the governor of New Hampshire and then serve as secretary of the treasury under Martin Van Buren. One day, as the boy labored, his ears cut the sound of soldiers marching. Taking a break from his work, Jeremiah stumbled upon a regiment of the New Hampshire militia. Jeremiah's amazement by the spectacle prompted one of the generals to approach the boy and grant him an honorary admission into the militia. Wilson would later note that this was one of the only bright moments of his childhood, inspiring him to serve in the Massachusetts militia in the years leading to the Civil War, a service which culminated in him becoming a general for the Union Army. When Jeremiah turned ten, his father Winthrop, strapped for cash and unable to support their family, had Jeremiah labor and live with a local farm owner, William Knight. The Knights were a hard-working family which managed to keep their land in good order and assure a boy akin to Jeremiah's status could learn to farm and labor. When Jeremiah turned sixteen, the Colbaths officially bound him out to William Knight as an indentured servant. Indentured servitude is, is essentially, it's a it's a kind of labor exploitation, which is why it's it's banned now and it has been for a very long time. Um, it's, it essentially means that uh, you agree, you make a contract, or the contract is made for you by your parents, and you agree to work normally from four to seven years. In the case of Henry Wilson, it was 10 years um, that he was indentured. And you agree to, to work for a person um, and do labor of almost anything you could think of. Um, and you're not really being paid for that. You're paying off a debt, essentially. Um, and uh, sometimes it includes room and board. Um, other times you would still live at home. Um, and it's not just children that can be indentured, uh, but, but uh, both men and women can be indentured, children, adults can be indentured. Um, and literally your, your family can decide that you're going to be indentured, which is what happened with Henry Wilson. While indentured servitude was for the most part in decline following the Revolutionary War, it remained a staple of rural and impoverished communities during the 19th century. Indentured servitude was very common. Many people coming over from Europe um, to, to the United States um, would have been indentured to pay off their passage uh, to, uh, to the United States. Most people couldn't afford to, to pay for that passage. Um, and so there were plenty of indentured people here. Um, I also want to make a distinction. Some people think that indentured servitude is equivocal to slavery, um, and it's it's really not. Uh, indentured servitude, you still have personal rights. Um, you can marry and have children. You can um, do all the things you would normally do um, in your life, um, and you are protected by the law. And uh, an enslaved person does not have any of those protections. You don't have bodily autonomy at all. Um, and you have no legal standing at all um, under the system. So I just wanted to point that out in, in case people might be confused by the two. The contract said that Wilson must, quote, faithfully serve, demean himself, and be true to his master, keeping his secrets and willingly obeying his commands, end quote. Jeremiah was prohibited from gambling, frequent travelers, playhouses, or alehouses, and he was forbidden from getting married or having sex. Um, I think he was, from my understanding, he was treated pretty well, but of course had to do a lot of work and didn't get to school that often, which was really, I think, of course, his objective was to get education. Um, and yet he did what he had to do. He followed the other agreements about um, not drinking and about not carousing. And, you know, he was a model person in those years, even though he was kind of enslaved. And of course that issue of slavery would come back to remind him about the slave issue later. Um, but I think he did his duty to the fullest uh, while he was uh, indentured in that way and did not rebel and did not run away, did not do anything uh, that uh, would um, hinder that agreement. Henry Wilson would have worked on the farm doing anything from tending animals to picking crops. 
or repairing things. Um, he was known as being very adept and very, very adaptive in his abilities. Um, so he was uh, you know, a very strong worker on the farm. Um, and he would have worked very long days and dentures normally work, work from a, at least when the sun is coming up until the sun is going down. Um, so you have, you know, almost 16 hour days. Um, and then if you're an indenture that's having to walk, <laughs> um, you also have to, you're figuring in that time. So it's not like you work 16 hours and you sleep um, the rest of the, of the day. You're going to have to do other things. You're going to have to get home. Um, so there's that as well. Throughout the long and laborious work on the night farm, the boy's young life was dreary and sorrowful. Later in his life, Wilson recounted that growing up, he had, quote, no cherished memories, no games, and no companions, end quote. While the boy's life was vapid of childlike lore, the one thing Jeremiah did have was a passion for education. Following the intense labor and very little rest, Jeremiah would stay awake once everyone had fallen asleep and read whatever was available. Some nights the boy would run to his home where he would find newspapers his mother had gathered for him. Jeremiah loved books detailing history, especially those of the Revolutionary War. Biographer Ernest McKay estimated that the boy read hundreds, if not thousands, of books throughout his years at the Knight Farm. Every free moment that he had, he was reading wherever he could and whatever he could get his hands on. In an age without music or podcasts to listen to, as Jeremiah worked, the books he had read the previous nights would play in his head, allowing him to escape from his dull, impoverished reality. Jeremiah got to attend school one day each month, although because of this inconsistent schedule, he was never able to take that academic experience to his advantage. Through the hard labor required of him, Jeremiah matured into a man, standing at 5 feet 10 inches tall, with broad shoulders and a muscular physique. Jeremiah also held a dark complexion, a characteristic which would later cause suspicion that he was a, quote, gypsy, a term associated with Romani travelers, which is considered by some to be offensive. He was known for carrying a cheerful and humorous spirit, despite a somewhat shy nature. At one point during his time on the Knight Farm, some of the other boys rumored that he had a crush on William Knight's daughter. On February 16, 1833, his 21st birthday, Jeremiah Jones' indentured servitude ended and he became a free man, accepting his payment of six sheep and a yoke of oxen. Jeremiah immediately sold the sheep, although because of his difficulty in finding a buyer, he held the oxen for a couple days longer, holding them at the night farm for a charge of 50 cents a day. After five years of indentured work, Jeremiah held a sum of $84 a less than optimal payment for his years of hard labor, but still a considerable amount in 1833 in the impoverished town. The newfound freedom inspired him to find a job on his own. He spent some months working on local farms, receiving a salary for the first time. I have a quote which actually came later, but relates to these years of Wilson uh, coming out and trying to get work at that age of 21, 22, and addressing the citizens of Great Falls later, he said the following, I know what it is to travel weary miles and ask my fellow men to give me leave to toil. I remember that in 1833, I walked into your village from my native town and went through your mills seeking employment. If anyone had offered me eight or nine dollars a month, I should have accepted it gladly. I went down to Salmon Falls. I went to Dover. I went to Newmarket and tried to get work without success and I returned home weary, but not discouraged. After I was 21, I went into the woods, drove team, 
cut mill logs, rose into the morning, worked hard until after dark. And at night, I received for it the magnificent sum of six dollars. When I got the money, those dollars looked as large to me as the moon looks tonight, unquote. Jeremiah continued to look for jobs with higher wages, but with the sparse jobs in the Farmington area, he fell out of luck. In June 1833, Jeremiah Jones filed a petition in the New Hampshire House. For what? Well, to change his name to Henry Wilson. Why the boy did this is for the most part unknown, but the three most prevalent theories are one, he admired a General James Wilson, two, he liked the name which he found in one of his many books, or three, a theory which is the most probable in my opinion, along with other Wilson biographers, is that he didn't want to carry the shame his name carried with it. Whether it be his father's alcoholism or the desperate nature in which he was named, he wanted to leave the past behind him, and that's what he did. I think um, probably the uh, whole thing of Jeremiah Colbath and uh, trying to uh, get an inheritance from a nearby farmer, I'm sure he heard about that notion uh, a fair amount in his early days. And I think that tore against his principle of wanting to um, be someone who would uh, be honored for not only what he did, but also be straightforward in the kinds of issues uh, and so forth that he did. I, I don't think there was any sort of at that time view of, you know, I think uh, I may be better in politics if I change my name or um, I'm going to be more successful if I'm Henry Wilson versus Jeremiah Colbath. I'm not so sure really that he thought in those terms, but I think he looked at who he admired and also maybe looked at the fact that maybe his name was representing something that might have been a little untoward at that point, uh, wanting to get an inheritance for the family and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I, I think he wanted to leave all of that behind, make a fresh new start. And at the age of 21, when free, he uh, made the change at that point and, of course, moved out of the area after trying to find something locally, uh, which is uh, what will be, uh, you know, important to him as well. Why do you think that Wilson changed his name? <laughs> I have no idea. That's John L. Myers. John began researching Henry Wilson in the 1970s and has written a comprehensive three-volume biography. Uh, I speculated in the book uh, some of the things that were told at the time. Uh, my guess is uh, the best explanation is he was ashamed of his drunken father. Uh, and I never was really satisfied with the explanations that were given of why he chose the name Henry Wilson. I guess we just accepted there was some good reason. By the end of 1833, Henry Wilson, a new man, heard he could earn higher wages making shoes in Massachusetts. The young man, eager to see the world, decided to leave Farmington. Henry packed his belongings and departed from his home. Imagine a cartoon traveler with a stick and sack, and that's pretty much what Henry looked like. He packed his clothes into a handkerchief and tied it to the end of a stick, holding it over his back. In an age before widely available transportation, the only method for him to journey was by foot, and that's just what he did. In December 1833, Henry Wilson, a newly freed but still impoverished man, set off for over 100 mile journey to a new life. I hope you enjoyed the first episode of Henry Wilson and the Civil War. Before we end, I wanted to share this poem written by Wilson's friend, John Greenleaf Whittier, about Wilson's childhood. The lowliest born of all the land, he wrung from fate's reluctant hand, the gifts which happier boyhood claims, and tasting of thankless soil, the bitter bread of unpaid toil. He fed his soul with noble aims, by the low hearth's fires, fitful blaze. 
he read of old heroic days. The sages thought the patriot speech, unhelped, alone, himself he taught. His school, the craft at which he wrought, his lore, the book, within his reach. I found that to be a very short and poetic summary of Wilson's young years. Today we covered Wilson's childhood, his time in indentured servitude, and the start of his journey into becoming a man. If you found today's episode interesting, I encourage you to subscribe or follow so you don't miss any new episodes. And if you're interested in seeing some pictures of Wilson's life and doing some more reading, check out henrywilsonhistory.com, my website dedicated to information on Henry Wilson. A huge thank you to Kaya Leach of the Farmington Historical Museum and Historical Society for his help in explaining Wilson's years in Farmington and indentured servitude. You can go to farmingtonnhhistory.org to learn more about the town's history. And also, thank you to Joe Weiss, who you'll be hearing a lot more from throughout the series. And another thank you to Wilson biographer John L. Myers for taking the time to speak with me throughout the series. I wanted to thank Professor Anna Sarani of Endicott University, who is an expert and author on indentured servitude, and provided me with some information relating to the history of the topic. Finally, thank you to Martin Skalekins for his music used throughout the episode. If you have any questions or comments you'd like to share, please email them to henrywilsonpodcast at gmail.com, and I will do my best to respond in a future episode. Thank you so much for listening. I can't wait to continue our journey into the life of Henry Wilson.